It's a new year and a new you, and you want to start exercising, losing weight, and eating healthy. Is there space for meat in that future? I'm going to let you decide after we meet the data. My name is Dr. Laureano Andrade Vicente, and I want to present data to you that I hope will change your dietary and lifestyle choices for the better. This is a talk about plant-based diets and heart health. I like to explain the importance of heart health, explain the functional anatomy of the heart, explain the mechanisms of heart disease, define known heart disease risk factors, and present studies on plant-based diets and heart health. I have no relevant financial disclosures to make regarding this lecture material. And here is a disclaimer, please read it. But what it essentially says is this is not professional medical advice or diagnosis or treatment of any disease. As it stands over the course of our lifetime, what is most likely to knock off you, me, your brother, and your mother is heart disease. It's the number one killer of Americans in 2021, worse than cancer, COVID-19, and things like car accidents and falls. So prevention is critical. And this is why, as you will see, your diet matters. Forget about what you look like in clothing, your double chin, or the gut you see in the mirror. Your diet matters because it is a progenitor of risk factors that may kill you in the future. So if your body was a car, the blood is the oil, the arteries are the pipes, the blood components are the quality, including the level of oxygen, and the heart is the motor. Your heart is an organ that sits in the middle of your chest and pumps oxygen-rich blood to the rest of the body via the way of the arteries. <clears throat> These arteries are tubes extending from the heart. The heart itself has arteries that supply the outer aspect of the heart and give the outer aspect of the heart oxygen. These are called coronary arteries or tubes. And these tubes can become blocked or obstructed by what is called plaque, which is this fatty filled, cholesterol filled, yellow material that blocks the inside of the tube that is the artery. Preventing oxygen delivery to the heart muscle, leading to the death of the heart muscle, just like an oil claw could damage your car. This abnormal state is termed coronary artery disease, and if damage occurs because of it, it's called a heart attack or a myocardial infarction. So the worse the obstruction, the higher likelihood of suffering a heart attack, which again is routinely fatal. So how does one just go from a partial block to a full-blown heart attack? <coughs> That plaque buildup may break open or rupture, and that rupture may cause the formation of a platelet plug or a blood clot plug that completely blocks the artery, or you get such a high level of blockage in the heart that not enough oxygen can get to the heart when it needs it the most, such as when we're exercising or we have a lung infection or some reason our heart is pumping faster than usual. And that lack of oxygen leads to a myocardial infarction or a heart attack. And if that heart attack destroys enough of the muscle, then the organ dies. And if the organ dies, the organ system dies, and then the organism, you, dies. <coughs> we don't want you to get to this point. So a specialist, a cardiologist, when he suspects someone is having a heart attack or has severe coronary artery disease or severe blocking in the tubes of the heart, they can confirm and treat their suspicion with a procedure called a cardiac catheterization, where they act as a plumber, and they'll snake through a wire into your tubes all the way up to the heart, where then they can push some dye into those very small tubes and see how much of the inside of the tube is available for blood to flow through. And that's what we're seeing here in this picture. And during that time, after they take those pictures, they can actually try to open up those arteries if they're significantly blocked. However, again, once you're at this point, you're already on the verge of dying, and it's a procedure has its own, which has its own risk. So we want to avoid you getting to this point. So how do we do that? <clears throat> what are the risk factors that we can track and measure, and more importantly, affect to decrease your risk of developing coronary artery disease, to decrease your risk of getting your arteries blocked to this extent. Well, there are non-modifiable risk factors like your age, your gender, uh, your family history of disease, and then there are modifiable ones, which we'll talk about here. It's smoking, 
high blood pressure. It is dyslipidemia, a scientific term for things like total cholesterol, triglycerides, low density lipoprotein or LDL, also known as lethal density lipoprotein, and high density lipoprotein or healthy, which you want the LDL to be low and the healthy HDL to be high. <coughs> You also watch our hemoglobin A1C, which is a uh, something that is typically high in diabetes, and it is a measure of how much sugar was in your blood over the course of approximately 100, 120 days. And finally, your diet, your weight, and your exercise level. All of these things are modifiable risk factors for disease, particularly for heart disease. And here we have data from a meta-analysis in 2009 that tried to quantify uh, the risk factors for heart disease development. And so you'll see at the top here is smoking. You have a 451% additional risk of developing heart disease if you are a smoker. Right up there is LDL, or a, AKA lethal density lipoprotein at 2.94 uh, relative risk. That is, you have 194% additional risk of developing heart disease. Other things we see here is total cholesterol, high blood pressure, inactivity, elevated hemoglobin A1C, a high BMI or body mass index, basically uh, a way of quantifying your weight based on your height and your diet. You notice there's a question mark there because what I really want to talk to you about here is the effect that diet may play on the relative risk of forming heart disease. And to do that, I'll be going through nine studies on plant-based diets and their effect on heart health. But in order to do so appropriately, I want to review with you some of the terminology researchers use while conducting this kind of research. So, a variable. You'll be seeing this term a lot. It's something that changes. The independent variable is the variable that the researcher manipulates or changes. And the dependent variable is the variable that the researcher measures or observes. And how you should conduct research is manipulate the independent variable and measures the effect on the dependent variable. So for example, in our studies, typically the independent variable will be diet. So it says plant diet versus diet versus meat-based diet. And he'll say 50 people will get a plant-based diet and 50 people will get a meat-based diet. And then I'll measure the effect of that intervention by measuring heart health. And they'll usually measure that by checking the heart attack rate or checking the degree of blockage in coronary arteries. And then they'll get that data. They'll run the study, they'll get the data, and then they'll put that data into a statistics equation. And that will run it, the statistics equations will run, and it will spit out a lot of different aspects of interpretation of the data itself. One of those interpretations will be a p-value. And that is a p-value, what a p-value is, is the probability of obtaining a result at least at the extreme of the current one, assuming that no difference is true. That's very complicated. That's very confusing. In a, in a more simpler way of saying this, if a p-value is less than 0.05, uh, the results are unlikely to be due to chance alone. And in fact, whatever the number of the p is, let's say it is 0.05, what it's saying is that there is a 95% chance that these results are not due to chance alone. These results didn't just happen by mistake. Something most likely produced these results. Now, it doesn't mean that your independent variable that you thought caused the change, for example, the plant-based diet, actually did cause the change. All it's saying is that something caused a change here that has unlikely to be just random chance that this, these results happen. But the beautiful thing about statistics is if you do the study appropriately and you collect enough demographic information and information about other independent variables that may have an effect on the dependent variable and you input them into the statistics equations to adjust for things like age, sex, income level, fitness level, BMI, you can produce a p-value that incorporates that information to narrow down and narrow down and narrow down the different reasons why the dependent variable, in this case heart health, may have changed. Anywho, that's really important for some of our studies. And again, when that p-value is less than 0.05, we call that statistically significant. I'll start with the earlier studies. 
So here we have Caldwell, Caldwell et al., 1995, A Strategy to Arrest and Reverse Coronary Artery Disease, a five-year longitudinal study. So what he did, this doctor, was he took 11 people and followed them over the course of five years. All of these 11 people were did not have diabetes, high blood pressure, or smoking history, don't have those risk factors, and all of them had already a catheterization-defined coronary artery disease. That is, that doctor, that cardiologist, went in there with a wire and injected dye into their tubes of the heart to see how much blockage there was there. <clears throat> so over the course of five years, he had these people eat a low-fat vegetarian diet. He put them on maximal cholesterol-lowering medication, that is, lovastatin and cholestyramine at the time. He had monthly doctor visits with them and monthly support groups, social support. So what was the result of that study? Of those 11 people, within their many coronary arteries, there were 25 plaques, 25 blockages within the tubes that supply oxygen to the heart. And that blockage decreased from 53.4% to 46.2, or approximately 77%, with a p-value less than 0.05, indicating statistical significance, indicating that these changes are unlikely to be due to chance alone. Those plaques of the 25 of them, 14 remained unchanged, and 11 got smaller. That's amazing. He also took images using a cardiac catheterization and injected dye into these these arteries, all of them. And he added an image to the research publication here where you can see this initially diseased blocked coronary artery right here has a much better dye flow approximately five years after the initiation of a very low fat plant-based diet. He also took lab markers of cardiac biomarkers such as cholesterol, LDL, LDL, HDL, and triglycerides. And although these do not have p-values associated with them, you can see that they have been halved in most of these um, laboratory parameters, except for the HDL. That has remained unchanged, and that typically remains unchanged when you initiate a low-fat plant-based diet, we've seen. But this was a very significant study because it is absolutely amazing to see coronary artery disease regress on its own. The other thing that I took away from this was that these coronary plaques, these fat-filled, cholesterol-filled blockages in the most important tubes of our body seem to, and again, this has not been proven at all, but in my mind, this intervention of plant-based diet, exercise, uh, physician visits, as well as uh, nutritional support, seem to stabilize those plaques from rupturing as much. Of course, small sample size, but that would be my conclusion from this study. There are some problems with this study. There was no control group. There's many, many different variables that were being manipulated. They did a per-protocol analysis, which really isn't uh, reflective of the uh, way in which the world works. If they were to do this in the way in which the world works, they would have uh, included all 22 patients in the final data analysis. Obviously, 11 people is not a lot of people, and there were a lot of missing data in the publication. We move on, however, to three years into the future with Dr. Ornish and his intensive lifestyle changes for the reversal of coronary heart disease. Now, what Dr. Ornish did was he did a randomized controlled trial with 48 people. They all had similar medical conditions, and they all had catheter-defined coronary artery disease, so they had blockage in their, their heart arteries. And he split them up, and over the course of five years, he gave half of the group a low-fat vegetarian diet and exercise program, smoking cessation, group support, and no lipid-lowering drugs, no statins, no cholestyramine. And the uh, control group received the standard of care for 1998, including lipid-lowering drugs like statins and cholestyramine. And what was the result of that study? Good old Ornish had a table published describing the mean percentage blockage in the treatment that is the plant-based group versus the control group comparing their blockaging at one, five, and five, one, but at the baseline, one year and five years. So here's on the x-axis, we baseline one year, five year. On the y-axis, we see the percent blockage. 
And the black dots represent the control group, the meat-based group, and the experimental group represents the plant-based group. And we can see as we move from baseline to one year to five years, there's a separation in the percent blockage. And in fact, between the two, where they initially started at approximately the same amount of coronary artery disease blockage, those beautiful, important tubules that bring oxygen to our heart, there's a difference in blockage at the end of 14.6%. That was a statistically significant difference, p-value 0.001, representing that this is very extremely unlikely to be due to chance alone. Incredible, incredible. Here we see again that there's this sort of, as you will see with my next presentation, a stabilization, it seems like, of the coronary artery plaque because uh, the reason why I think this, I think it, I don't know it, but I think it. The MACE rate over five years in this study, MACE being major adverse cardiac event, that means dying from cardiac disease, heart disease, heart attack, having a heart attack, having a stroke, or being admitted to the hospital for heart failure over five years in the meat-based intervention group the was 45%, whereas in the plant-based diet group, experimental group, it was 18%, p-value less than 0 0.001. So again, I feel like we're seeing the stabilization uh, with statistically significant results, but unfortunately there are some problems with this studies. Um, it was deliberately manipulating several independent variables at once. For example, one group was in cholesterol meds, one wasn't. Um, there was many different independent variables like the uh, exercise, uh, uh, the, the nutritional support, the physician-based visits, and it was still a small sample size. So, you know, so we can't really conclude that the plants were doing what we think they are doing yet. But nonetheless, that group of interventions seems to be part extremely significant in producing stabilization of the coronary artery plaques as a mechanistic explanation for why we see the difference in MACE rate, um, as well as producing a decrease in the coronary artery blockage, or those little tubules blockage rate. We then move on then to Capagoda and what he did in 2006 where he measured the cardiac event rate, the MACE rate, in a similar approach to Ornish with lifestyle modifications like you know, weight to exercise, diet, in patients with chronic coronary artery disease. So, Capagoda took 134 people in a longitudinal study. <clears throat> All of them had varying comorbid conditions. That is, some of them had diabetes, some of them hypertension, some of hyperlipidemia. All of them had catheter-defined or myocardial infarction-defined or heart attack-defined coronary artery disease. And for two years, he gave half of them a low-fat vegetarian diet, continued their pre-existing medications, gave them exercise plan and stress management uh, counseling. And he compared those to people who were non-adherent to the original program. <clears throat> and what were the results? Well, Capagoda took those 130-odd people and measured the MACE rate over 10 years, the cardiac death, heart attack, stroke, heart failure, hospitalization rate over 10 years, and found that in the non-compliant meat, uh, well, the non-compliant group that uh, did not adhere to a plant-based low-fat diet had a 18% MACE rate, whereas the, those who did adhere to low plant fat-based diet had a MACE rate over 10 years, the 1.5% p-value less than 0.05, indicating statistical significance. Now, again, we see that in this group of interventions, plant-based diet, low-fat diet, exercise, nutritional support, we find that there is seems to be a protective effect for the uh, worsening of coronary artery disease, or at least the outcomes related to coronary artery disease. And so what is what is going on with that? Well, I have my theory. So let's go through my theories here. This is a, a coronary artery, a uh, right coronary artery that is approximately 75% blocked and stained with a stain to help us visualize the structures internally better. This whole thing is the artery, the little tubule that supplies oxygen to the heart. This is the open portion of the artery where blood can now flow through. Again, only 25% remaining. 
Here is the uh, the fatty plaque, the, the plaque that is filled with cholesterol and fatty acids and obstructing this artery. And then here is the capsule. So this capsule is critically important to the stability of this plaque. This fibrous capsule, if it ruptures, will 100% cause a heart attack. It will initiate the formation of a blood clot in that artery that will typically 100% obstruct that artery. This doesn't matter if it's 50%, 25% plaque, you know, 75% plaque. Typically, when you get that rupture, it will cause a heart attack. All right, the capsule rupture, then, then the platelet or the blood clot that forms there in that area will block completely the, the, the flow of blood and you get a heart attack. And so what I think, and in fact, in another lecture I will be presenting to you, there are proteins and factors that are involved in the stabilization and the formation of this fibrous capsule that are in fact, typically on the studies that I've reviewed, elevated in vegetarian, low-fat plant-based diets as compared to meat-based diets. But that's for another lecture. We move on. Kappa Goda also looked at cardiac disease or heart disease risk factors, such as the lipid panels, and found that total cholesterol and LDL were significantly decreased with a p-value less than 0.05 in the intervention plant-based group as compared to the uh, non-compliant patients. And that, we also see the HDLs unchanged as has been consistent throughout all of our studies on plant-based diets. Some problems with the study, there are very few women, and this study is very male-based, many independent variables. There's no real control group, just whoever was non-compliant. We did a per-protocol analysis, and uh, with that design, with the longitudinal study design, it's difficult to conclude causality because you're not truly just changing one thing at a time and measuring the effect on the dependent variable. Caldwell uh, came back for round two with his paper in 2014 uh, about a way to reverse coronary artery disease question mark. So what Caldwell did here was he took 198 people in a longitudinal study. They all had varying comorbid conditions, such as diabetes, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, and they all had catheter-defined or myocardial infarction or heart attack-defined coronary artery disease. And he watched those people for five years. And to the people who were adherent to the program, they were on a low-fat vegetarian diet, continued their pre-existing meds, had a five-hour plant-based diet into a seminar and monthly consultation with Dr. Caldwell. And whoever was not adherent to the program was compared uh, to this uh, intervention group. And what was the results of this study? Well, here we are back at the MACE rate. So here we see the MACE rate again. And in the low-fat plant-based diet group, it was 10%. And the non-adherent patients, that is 21 people, it was 62% with a p-value less than 0.05 indicating statistical significance. He also took some images of the cardiac catheterization from patients within this study and you can see there is a qu quite obviously significant reversal of coronary artery disease in this patient from before and after the plant-based diet, low-fat diet intervention. Again, these things are truly, truly unheard of without usually cardiac catheterization intervention. So that, that again, this that image is amazing to me. Some problems with the study. Again, there's no control groups, a lot of independent variables, some missing data characteristics, missing demographics. But we move on now to the more recent studies, which I think will be eye-opening as well. Um, in 2016, the Carville study. Let's look at that one. Now, I'm going to stick to just the lipid panels uh, and cardiac biomarkers will be for another lecture. But uh, Navarro et al. in 2016 did a cross-sectional study of 84 men with a mean age of 46, all of them to be free of medical history of diabetes, hypertension, or coronary artery disease, all of them to be free of cardiac disease. And what he did was there was half of these people who were vegetarian for at least three years and half of them who had been meat eaters for three years. And then he, well, all he did was took blood work for cardiac risk factors and compared the two. And what he found was in the vegetarians, there was a significant decrease in total cholesterol, LDL, triglyceride, and hemoglobin A1C as compared to the meat eaters. 
Uh, typically, as we have seen in other studies, the HDL doesn't really change much with a vegetarian diet. We move on to Deja Ketal in 2020, who did a study on uh, ischemic heart disease and the effect that a vegetarian diet may have on this. And this was an interesting study in the sense that it was a crossover study, randomized controlled crossover study. So what that means is that the people who initially ate a vegetarian diet for four weeks in this case, at the end of the four weeks, ate a meat-based diet for four weeks, and then they uh, evaluated each group to determine uh, cardiac biomarkers and such. So he took 31 people, all with similar age and medical conditions, all with optimal cholesterol and blood pressure lowering medications, put them on a four week diet that were equal in low calorie and macronutrients. Just one was vegetarian and one was meat based. What was the result? He also had these meals delivered to them by a chef, so they weren't cooking. Well, the result was that if you were post-vegetarian diet, you had a significantly decreased oxidized LDL, total cholesterol and LDL as compared to post-meat-based diet. P-value less than 0.05 indicating statistical significance. We also see that represented within this graph where the post-intervention diet and the vegetarian diet represented in black had a mean change in their LDLC from approximately 61 to 55, whereas the post-healthy meat-based, quote-unquote healthy meat-based diet went from about 64 to 60, but the difference between the two was significant. Now, I thought it was a good study. It's interesting because of the manner in which the crossover happens, you know. You put somebody on a meat-based diet for four weeks, then switch them to a vegetarian diet, they still retain the healthy, protective effects of the vegetarian diet. It's quite amazing. We move on then to uh, the broad study by Wright and et al. in 2017. They did a randomized controlled trial using whole food plant-based diet in the community for obesity, ischemic heart disease, or diabetes. And what they did was they took 65 people, all of which met the category of being obese, that is a BMI greater than 30, a body mass index greater than 30. They all continued their home medications, and they all had to be obese and have at least one other condition, high heart disease, diabetes, high blood pressure, or high cholesterol. And they told them, eat as much food as you want to eat. Just follow these specific categories of food. There was a low-fat vegetarian diet which again, they said, eat as much as you want. Do not calorie count. You don't need to exercise and you don't need to meal prep. You just eat as much as you want as long as you stay within these categories. And then there was a meat-based diet. Again, what were the result of this study? They also got bi-weekly meetings and chef-guided cooking tutorial. What were the result? Well, they found that if we look at this graph here, on the x-axis, we have baseline six months and one year. On the y-axis, we have the weight of the groups, black dots being control group, white being experimental. They, everyone lost, well, there was no significant weight loss in the meat-based diet, but there was a very large statistically significant weight loss of 19 pounds um, in six months in the plant-based diet and 25 pounds in the plant-based diet, again. What is amazing to me about this study is that these patients were not told to restrict their calories. They just said eat plant-based food and they lost weight. And you'll also note, if looking at the cardiac biomarkers, the LDL, the uh, total cholesterol, and the hemoglobin A1C was statistically significantly decreased as compared to the meat-based diet intervention as we are seeing here. We move on then to the REGARD study uh, to dietary patterns and incident heart failure in U.S. adults without known coronary artery disease in 2019 by Dr. Lada et al. Now what was done in this study was they took 16,068 adults at the prospective cohort study, mean age of 65, all of whom who were determined to be free of current cardiac disease based on their medical history, lab work, and medication list and they graded their diet via survey admissions over the course of 8.7 years. 
And what was the result of that study? The risk of heart failure in 8.7 years overall for the diet that was determined to be the least healthy, least plant-based diet was 72% more than usual. So 172. Whereas the plant-based diet in the most healthy version of it was negative 42% risk of heart failure in 8.7 years. So how they did this study was they sent out those questionnaires periodically over 8.7 years and then graded their diet based on their responses into quartiles. Where the fourth quartile, the healthier, more plant-based diet, and the first quartile is the least healthy, least plant-based diet. And they particularly compare different styles of diet. I've included here the Southern diet, which they called based on the level of fried food, meat-based food, as well as processed food, and the plant-based diet being more plant-based, low-fat, healthier. And they found that the hazard ratio, which just says really the odds that an individual in the group reaches a higher hazard or higher uh, poor outcome first is 0 0.6 in the plant-based diet and up to 1.72 in the less healthy, uh, more southern, more fried food diet. All, all this to say that this study was able to account for, due to the manner in which the study was conducted, or just the study results for age, sex, race, education, household income, region, total calorie intake, smoking, physical activity, and sodium intake. And the, the results that you see from this table adjust for all of those things. And still, this relationship persists with a p-value less than 0 0.005, indicating statistical significance, indicating that it is highly unlikely that chance produced these results. Problems with this study is the questionnaires can be wrought with fraudulent answer and recall bias, and this study was limited to black and white, affecting the ability for us to say that this is reflective of the rest of the United States. We have one more study for you, and that's the Cardia study. It's a plant-centered diet uh, and risk of incident cardiovascular disease during young and middle adulthood by Choi et al. in 2021. The Cardia study took a similar approach to the previous study in that they followed a large amount of people, in this case young adults aged 18 to 30, all who had similar medical conditions and all of whom which were free of cardiac disease, and they graded their diet for 32 years. And instead of using a questionnaire, they used trained interviewers to collect this information. What were the result of that study? Well, what they did with their grading is that they broke up the diet grade or how good or healthy the diet is into quintiles that is into fifths of the fifth quintile being the most healthy diet and the first quintile being the least and they graded their mace rate or the major adverse cardiac event rate in 32 years and the people in the lowest quintile had a 3.7 percent uh, event rate and those were people who were eating processed foods red meat um, animal products and the people in the fifth quintile were eating a low-fat, uh, plant-based diet, and their event rate was 1.3% uh, mace rate. That's almost a three-fold difference in mace rate, uh, which, again, to me is incredible. But what is also incredible with this study as well as the last study, with their ability to break up this risk of heart attacks uh, into quintiles and then to be able to control for I'm going to point this out to you here. Age, sex, race, total calorie intake, maximum educational attainment, smoking status, and physical activity level for 2,621 individuals. And they found that this relationship between the level of healthy plant-based diet eating and mace rate persisted with a p-value less than 0.05, indicating statistical significance. Now, after presenting all of these studies to you and reviewing all these studies for myself, my suspicion is that the low-fat, plant-based diet in conjunction with an exercise plan, routine medical follow-up, and social support as well as nutritional support lowers several heart disease risk factors, include lipids, weight, BMI, and maybe hemoglobin A1C. 
and the risk of major adverse cardiac events as compared to isochloric, that is same calorie, meat-based diets. My question to you is, what is yours? And if you're on the fence about it, is that steak or that piece of chicken really worth the risk that you'd be taking on if this were true? With that said, if you're somebody who's after watching this video is looking to make a change in your life, while this lecture is not meant to be a guide on how to do this, I want to give you some quick points on how you can begin this journey. The first step is to change your diet, the second is to start an exercise plan, and the third is to track your progress. I don't know how to cook vegetarian food. I feel like that is one of the largest barriers people had have to converting to vegetarianism that they think they don't like the food. I personally wouldn't want to eat carrots all day either. That is why I use and I recommend using a meal prep service at least in the beginning. I use Factor and what it is is they'll deliver 8 to 12 to 16 meals per week to my door with fully cooked, fully prepared vegetarian food that is fresh and not frozen, low calorie, tastes great, and is healthy. At $108 per week for 8 meals, uh, it is pricey, but I view it as an investment into my health and I don't think I could have been of insurance for as long as I had without a meal delivery service. If you're not looking to get a meal delivery service and you want to follow the diet to the letter that Dr. Caldwell and some of the early studies used, you can buy their cookbooks on Amazon. You can also think about vegan brand meat alternatives like Daring Cajun Chicken, Beyond Meat, Impossible Burger, and Morning Star. I have no relationship to these companies as well as starting an exercise plan. On a weekly basis, you should be getting 75 to 150 minutes of moderate to vigorous aerobic, aka cardio, cardio activity. That's like jogging, running, swimming, and cycling. You should also do 120 minutes of strength training, hitting all the major muscle groups like your legs, hips, back, abdomen, chest, shoulders, and arms. From the social and educational aspect, you can consider joining clubs, sports, and dancing, using a trainer while at the gym, or asking a more experienced friend and see your physician before starting a new exercise plan. This is my exercise plan. You don't have to follow this. I'm just giving you an example of something you can do. You finally should track your progress. There are smart scales now that can connect to your iPhone to make tracking the calories you eat, the fat you eat, the carbohydrates you eat, and the protein you eat much, much easier. Again, a simple way to get started is to change your diet, start an exercise plan, and track your progress. My name is Lariano Andrade Vicente. It has been an absolute pleasure to discuss with you the plant-based diet research that is available and how it may affect your heart health. Again, while this is not medical advice, I would encourage you all to do your own research as to what might be the best diet for you and continue to review constantly the new data that comes out. If you enjoyed this video, I would encourage you to share, like this video, and perhaps spread it to your friends and family to see if what we've done here may have an impact on them. Here are my work cited. Again, it's been an absolute pleasure and I wish you luck in the rest of your health journey.